Uh, I'm Dr. Posinki, you know that because that's my name on the slides. Uh, <laughs> so um, this topic of my talk is maybe a tiny bit different than what appears in your programs because I think managing fatigue or um, uh, in any case, what I know about is evaluation and management of fatigue, living with fatigue is a totally different issue, I think. So uh, I have no financial conflicts of interest to disclose. I don't get any outside funding for anything. Uh, most of what I'm going to tell you about is stuff that I've learned from my patients over the years. There's not a lot of evidence base to support it. I will discuss some off-label uses of some medications. So first step in trying to figure out why other stainless patients are tired is obviously a thorough evaluation. So that means a history of physical examination, laboratory testing, uh, to try and elucidate some of the causes. Most likely there are going to be many contributing to fatigue. Um, psychological well-being is important just because depression can aggravate fatigue and vice versa. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, and obviously the reason why a thorough evaluation is critical is because treatment is going to depend on what the results of your evaluation are. So also I think it's pretty clear that treatment has to be individualized, that, that uh, no two people are alike, no two people's fatigue is going to have exactly the same root causes. Um, when, when fatigue becomes severe, you'll often need to involve some other team members besides just your, uh, your clinician, your physician, but there should still be somebody coordinating the care and all the members of the team. Um, similarly, uh, patients and their physicians need to be on the same page, need to work together to develop a treatment plan, uh, and it's important that uh, objectives are clear and that uh, goals are realistic that if you used to be a marathon runner and now you can hardly get out of bed, it's probably not realistic to expect that any treatment of your fatigue, no matter how successful, is going to get you back running 26 miles again. Uh, for me, the usual goals of treatment are pretty simple. Uh, alleviating symptoms, improving functional capacity so you can do more of the things that you want to do or enjoy doing or need to do, uh, and improving quality of life. But again, it's important that, that uh, physician and patient are on the same page. So I think it's pretty obvious that there's no one cause for fatigue in ehlers danlos There are many, many factors that contribute to fatigue. Um, the big ones, and it's interesting that Tony Klein mentioned this even in her pediatric population, that the big ones are pain, poor sleep, and depression. Uh, autonomic nervous system dysfunction can be caused by severe fatigue, but also can aggravate, by, aggravate fatigue. Um, there are a number of metabolic factors that can affect and contribute to fatigue. I'm just going to talk about some of the most common ones. Um, inadequate rest is a surprisingly common factor in fatigue. Uh, people understandably try to push their limits and often are faced with situations where they feel tired, but gee, there's something I really wanted to get done or there's something I need to do, so I'm just going to pretend I'm not tired and do it anyway, or I'm going to hit the caffeine or do, or even kick in some of my own adrenaline to push through the fatigue and get something done. Uh, that is a, uh, not a helpful way to manage fatigue. Um, reminder that cognitive tasks draw from the same energy pool that physical activity does. So when you're trying to plan your energy budget for the day, keep that in mind. Um, emotional stresses uh, are a big energy drain, whether it's concern about yourself, family members, financial issues, uh, the issues going on in the world around us, um, and then their everyday life stresses, the one that I deal with most often living in the Washington area is getting in the car almost any time, any day to drive anywhere is stressful. So, so uh, I think it's important to recognize these major factors as part of a vicious cycle that um, depression tends to make you more sensitive to pain, depression tends to make you feel tired and don't feel like doing anything, depression tends to disrupt your sleep. Similarly, Chronic pain causes depression, chronic pain makes you tired, pain disrupts your sleep. So to really address fatigue, you need to address all of these issues simultaneously. Um, you know, as long as you're in pain, 
you're not going to sleep well, you're going to be tired, you're going to be depressed. As long as you're depressed, it's going to be hard to get your pain and your sleep and your fatigue to improve. Uh, clearly, there's no magic formula. Different things, different combinations of things are going to work for different people. Um, and this is a slide where a nice young woman is watching television, a pharmaceutical ad comes on the TV, and it says, ask your doctor if taking a pill to solve all your problems is right for you. So, reminder that uh, medications are very helpful, but there's a lot of non-medical therapies that are helpful as well. Of course, no, pa no two patients have identical symptoms, and frankly, even if, even if there were two patients who had identical symptoms, their response to their symptoms would be different, their response to treatments would be different, uh, based on their own psychological factors, their outlook, their approach, uh, their support systems, um, and then physical factors like their pre-illness state of health. Um, I'm interested in pharmacogenetics and how different people respond to, to medications and metabolize medications differently. So there's tremendous uh, variability from person to person, uh, a challenge for all of us who care for Ehlers-Danlos patients. Of course, it's not just Ehlers-Danlos patients, it's everyone. Uh, for those of you who live with pain, this is a, this is a no brainer, uh, but for people who don't, it's not always obvious why pain causes fatigue. Uh, but of course, pain itself just sort of saps your energy, but, but also limits your activity. So then the more you sit around, the more sluggish you feel, the more you sit around, the more muscle tone you lose. So then when you do go to do something, you tire out more quickly. Um, pain, of course, by disrupting your sleep, aggravates your fatigue. Pain contributes to depression, which aggravates your fatigue. Uh, there's a variety of other mechanisms, including some hormonal ones. Uh, so pain is a big, big factor in fatigue in Ehlers-Danlos patients. This is a uh, reminder here. Guys goes to the doctor complaining of pain, and the doctor looks at him and wiggles the knife in his chest and says, uh, does it hurt when I do this? So this is to make the point that sometimes pain is obvious, and you can tell where the cause is, and you can tell where the pain is and, and what's going on. But a lot of times, pain isn't obvious. You're either you may not be aware of how much pain you're in. Uh, you may even be dealing with something we call referred pain, where you feel pain in a certain part of your body, but it's actually coming from somewhere else. So pain is not always this obvious, unfortunately. The other big factor in the pain management is that people tend to underestimate their pain. This is not just, gee, I'm in pain and I'm gonna ignore it. This is one saying, gee, pain's not that bad. I'm used to it, I've been in pain a long time. I can deal with it. I don't wanna take a lot of pain medication. Uh, that's really not a helpful approach to managing chronic pain. Um, background pain is a, is a concept that I used to, to sort of explain to people that when you've been in pain for a while, you do get used to it, and, and up to a certain level, you're not consciously aware of it, uh, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Um, the other important thing that a lot of people don't realize is that adrenaline tends to mask pain, and since pain often triggers adrenaline, some people deal with their pain by keeping their stress levels high. And as long as there's a lot of adrenaline running around, they don't notice how much pain they're in. That doesn't mean it's not there. Um, it's important to look at different sources or what I call different types of pain, because obviously the treatment is gonna depend on what the cause of the pain is. So there are a number of different types of pain, but the, the major ones that uh, we see in Ehlers-Danlos patients are some pain is inflammatory, uh, and you've probably heard or read that you know, Ehlers-Danlos itself is not an inflammatory condition the way something like lupus is an inflammatory condition. It's primarily a structural mechanical thing, but that doesn't mean there aren't inflammatory components to your pain, the big one being the chronic strain on your muscles trying to hold your joints together all day as you move. That pain is usually inflammatory, and often anti-inflammatories help with that. Um, the primary source of mechanical pain is the sort of chronic muscle spasm that develops around your joints, in your neck, from just being over tired, overstressed for too long, again, trying to support unstable joints. Mechanical pain often doesn't respond to anti-inflammatories. Uh, sometimes it'll respond to uh, muscle relaxants, but it also responds very well to uh, mechanical measures, especially heat, various uh, physical therapy techniques. And then there's uh, neuropathic pain, and neuropathic pain can be you know, either direct, you have pressure on a disc, you have pressure on a spinal cord or something causing pain, um, but also some neuropathic pain syndromes 
Uh, one is called allodynia, where even, even just a gentle touch on your skin is painful. Um, and the, the important point that I try to make about neuropathic pain in Ehlers-Danlos is that the etiology, the, the underpinnings of, of neuropathic pain in most of the Ehlers-Danlos patients I see is chronic undertreatment of pain. So it seems kind of obvious what I tell people is pain is your body's attempt to get your brain's attention. Say there's a problem, you do something about it. If you don't address that adequately, if you ignore it, then your body makes that pain signal essentially hurt more and more and more. Um, and if you really ignore it for too long, then you get into this stinging, burning, these really nasty uh, neuropathic pain syndromes. Of course, we have some medications that are, that are sometimes helpful, and the medications that are helpful for neuropathic pain are very different from the medications we use for other types of pain. So this being 2018, um, uh, Dr. Tischler gave a good talk on, on using opioids. I'm very optimistic. Uh, Maryland has only recently joined the ranks of states where uh, cannabinoids are legal but they're making it more and more difficult for people to get opioids. So um, there are a limited number of medications that we have to help people manage pain. It's a short list. It's Tylenol and it's sort of cousin tramadol. It's the anti-inflammatories. It's the neuropathic pain drugs like diloxetine and, uh, uh, and lamasopran and then drugs like gabapentin and Lyrica. Sometimes the muscle relaxants are helpful at relieving pain. Sometimes some medications, um, other medications like amitriptyline have some pain effects. You have some topical therapies uh, and then you're left with opioids. So we try to avoid using opioids unless absolutely necessary, but some people get down that list and nothing else has worked or worked sufficiently to relieve their pain. Cannabinoids, I'm helpful over time. As the science evolves, we're gonna find certain strains that are effective for certain symptoms. I already, this week for the first time, saw somebody who has, who has replaced her short-term acute as needed narcotic with a uh, cannabinoid. And that's very hopeful. Uh, like pain, uh, a lot of people tend to underestimate how significant their depression is. Um, there's the same feelings of, gee, of course I'm depressed, I've been sick a long time, nobody understands what's wrong with me, uh, I, I'm used to this, I, I, you know, I, I don't need to, uh, counseling, I don't need antidepressants, I can deal with this. Uh, that's not really helpful and we're not suggesting that you're not dealing with it properly. Um, we know that chronic pain depletes certain feel-good transmitter, neurotransmitters. Uh, it's also important to remember that you don't have to be sad to be depressed. I'll put up a slide in a second that, you know, for some people just lack of motivation, lack of interest, fatigue, trouble concentrating, those are their depression symptoms. Um, and similarly, deficiency of some of these important neurotransmitters can be significant even if you don't have obvious symptoms of depression. And then finally, don't overlook non-pharmacologic measures. I know Maggie Buckley spent a lot of time talking about uh, non-pharmacologic measures. This is another slide to emphasize that point. A woman goes to the doctor and she says, my, I think my medication, my dose needs adjusting. I'm not nearly as happy as the people in the ads. So unfortunately, I think that's, you know, <laughs> talk about realistic goals. I think being as happy in the ads as the people in the ads is probably not realistic. <laughs> but, um, and then this is another cartoon I found recently where to emphasize that, yes, your druggist can be invaluable, but if you have a good huggist, that can help you too, whether it's a family member or a pet or even your favorite stuffed animal, that usually a combination of medications and non-medication therapies are gonna be what, what gets you better. So like pain, uh, different types of depression respond to different pharmacologic treatments. So if your non-pharmacologic measures have not gotten you where you need to be, um, and in this situation, this is, a, this is a diagram I came across many years ago that I found very helpful for explaining to patients. These are basically pointing out the typical symptoms that we associate with deficiency of the major neurotransmitters in depression. A very common scenario I see is that people have been started on small doses of, or, or even bigger doses of serotonin type antidepressants, which which our clinical practice guidelines tell us we should use first line. And that helps them be less anxious, be less worried, be less irritable. But they say, gee, I'm still sluggish. I don't feel like doing anything. I have trouble concentrating. Uh, 
And I, it's very reassuring to show them this and say, well, look, these symptoms that you're still having are not serotonergic symptoms. So it's not surprising that your medication isn't helping with those things. Uh, and so often this means a combination of medications or some of the newer antidepressants that affect more than one neurotransmitter. So again, common theme here, like depression and pain, you know, how we address sleep problems is gonna depend on what the sleep problems are. Certainly getting to sleep is a problem for a lot of people that can be anxiety, worry, worry about your health, worry about family keeps you awake at night. Just being in pain, I can't get comfortable is a very common problem. Again, people tend to underestimate how much pain they're in even at bedtime. Um, some people have a restless leg thing and as soon as they get in bed, they feel fidgety and have to get up again. Uh, hyperarousal, we'll come back to, that's really a, an autonomic issue for, you know, you drag through the whole day feeling exhausted and then late in the evening, suddenly you're wide awake and it's bedtime and gee, this is the most awake I've been all day. Uh, don't overlook environmental factors. Uh, a lot of people don't change mattresses often enough. Uh, most, many patients with Ehlers-Danlos are overly sensitive to sensory stimuli, so you can be more sensitive to little bits of background light or background noise. Um, noisy and uh, disruptive bed partners are a surprisingly common problem and uh, presumably not easy to get rid of, but I see a lot, of, a lot of patients who say, gee, if my spouse is away, I sleep much better. Uh, so sometimes we can get the spouse to do something about his or her snoring or his or her own sleep problems and, and that'll help. Um, some people fall asleep okay, but then have trouble staying asleep or wake up overnight and have trouble getting back to sleep. And that's slightly different issues there. Um, and then uh, pain often wakes people overnight. Uh, sleep apnea is a common problem. Snoring is common. A uh, number of Ehlers-Danlos patients wake with vivid dreams overnight. And then, unfortunately, the, the really poorly understood one we'll talk about a little bit is the people who have no trouble falling asleep don't wake up a lot overnight, don't have sleep apnea, don't have it move around a lot, but just wake up in the morning feeling unrefreshed. So, like pain and depression, it's surprising how many people don't realize how bad their sleep is. Um, Say, well, yeah, this is the way I've, I've always slept that way. Uh, I'm not a great sleeper. I don't, you know, I, I can deal with this. I don't want to take sleeping pills. Um, and uh, my favorite is the person who says, uh, I'm a great sleeper. I can sleep anytime, anywhere. I can sleep 10, 12, 14 hours, no problem. I can get up in the morning and then a couple hours later go back to sleep again. Uh, and I say, well, gee, I think that means you're not a good sleeper. And then I say, no, 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 I'm a great sleeper. I can, I can sleep, I have no problem sleeping. Um, so there's a lot of this misperception. We know that many, if not most patients with sleep apnea don't realize they have apnea. Uh, I've seen a number of people over the years with periodic limb movements, just moving arms and legs around all night, not aware of it. Surprisingly, their bed partner's also not aware of it. Um, and then the most common pattern we see in Ehlers-Danlos uh, is um, a sleep disorder that's characterized by what we call arousals, frequent disruptions to the continuity of sleep, and then a lack of deep or what we call slow wave sleep. Um, and that often does not cause any symptoms except feeling unrested, unwakened. So uh, sleep studies are very helpful um, if they're carefully interpreted. And I'll show you what that means, what I mean by that in a minute. Um, home sleep monitors can be helpful. I think the latest iteration of some of these home monitors like the Fitbits, uh, the new algorithms seem to be a little more accurate and in giving some assessment of how, uh, how disrupted sleep is, how many awakenings there are during the course of the night. Um, in cases where those aren't available, sometimes just a simple uh, heart rate monitor can, uh, can be helpful. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. If you're, you know, typically if you're asleep, if you're sleeping well and somebody, and you were to monitor your heart rate, it would be just kind of steady and, and flat and slow. So if you've got to slip on a heart rate monitor overnight and see your heart rate is going up and down all night, that may be a clue to what's wrong with your sleep. So I'm gonna try the pointer here. So there we go. Okay, so very quickly, um, normally people who sleep well will start off in light sleep, but quickly get into deep sleep, light sleep, REM, light sleep, often a little more deep sleep here shallow sleep, REM, light sleep, REM, light, REM. REM. So you see there's a fairly regular cycle of th through the stages of sleep with most of the deep sleep being early at night. 
This is a very common, almost typical pattern of somebody with sailor's dandelion who says, gee, I fall asleep okay, sleep through the night okay, I wake up feeling like I haven't slept. Uh, so you see that there's no deep sleep, there's almost no REM, there's nothing that looks like a cycle. What you don't see there is in the sleep lab, we define an awakening as a disruption to the continuity of your sleep that lasts more than 30 seconds. It turns out most people have to be awake for at least two minutes to remember having been awake. Um, so this person remembered waking up twice, she actually woke up 23 times. If the continuity of your, continuity of your sleep is disrupted for less than 30 seconds, we call that an arousal, she had 125 arousals. So her sleep was disrupted 150 times. That's like somebody tapping you on the shoulder every 30 seconds all night long. Uh, so no wonder you don't feel rested when you wake up. So this is a slide that I think is wrong because in this case, the, the uh, physician is telling the patient that the MRI shows that his head is riddled with conventional wisdom, whereas what you guys deal with all the time is physicians whose head are riddled with conventional wisdom. Uh, case in point being the, sitting do this, being the board certified sleep physician, physician who read this as a normal sleep study. So a lot of people ask me, where should I go for a sleep study? And I usually can't recommend a good sleep lab, but the most important thing that you really want is you wanna get data. This is called a hypnogram. You don't wanna get a couple paragraphs that says you had so many of this and so many of that. You wanna see when you had it so that you can see what's related to what. So these are sleep stages. And then uh, oxygen level, body position, heart rate, so by looking at body position, you can see, well, if somebody's moving around a lot at night and each time they move, they wake up, then they're probably in pain. Uh, if you see that, if you see lots of these spikes in heart rate and you see that each one of those spikes lines up with an awakening, then you say, okay, this person is making adrenaline, that's either pain or that's an autonomic problem. Uh, what you do see nicely here is that for whatever reason, this person's heart rate was calm and quiet, their autonomic nervous system was calm and quiet for a short period here, and they got one decent chunk of deep sleep. The rest of the night, their sleep is disrupted. Each time they try to get into deep sleep, they wake up again. So again, we wanna look at basic stuff first if you're not sleeping well. Um, good sleep hygiene basically means use your bed for sleeping, don't do lots of other activities in bed and confuse your body, you want your body to figure out that bed is for sleeping, uh, comfortable mattress, dark and quiet we talked about. Um, and again, treating sleep apnea and things like limb movements, but really only if they're significant. Uh, it's not uncommon at all for me to see somebody who has say 150 sleep disruptions and maybe 25 or 30 of them are sleep apnea related. And the physician says, well, I don't know, eh, but I know what to do about sleep apnea. So here's this mask, wear this mask, and then both the patient and the physician are, are frustrated when the patient says, well, I don't feel any better. This is, I don't think this is helping me sleep. And of course, you know, you wouldn't really expect if there's 150 arousals and you only take 25 or 30 of them out of the picture, you, there's not gonna be a noticeable improvement in the quality of sleep. So uh, often non-pharmacologic measures are not enough and we need medications to try to improve the quality of people's sleep. Usually this is a, you know, more than one thing because often people need something to help them fall asleep. They may need something else to help increase deep sleep. They may need something else to reduce the number of arousals during the night. And this is often a frustrating trial and error process of finding the right medicines at the right dose and the right combinations. So uh, what I found helpful over the years and, and just showed you this whole business with the heart rate fluctuations and this whole suggestion that there's too much adrenaline running around at night has that medications that either, either block adrenaline or reduce adrenaline production often improve quality of sleep. Um, uh, and then for some people who don't tolerate those or they're not effective uh, medications like um, the benzodiazepines, which works by raising the level of calming chemicals in your brain to offset the stimulating stuff um, can be helpful. Uh, again, pain is usually people don't appreciate how much pain is disrupting their sleep. Uh, a lot of medications, uh, for example, uh, flexoril cyclobenzaprine is a muscle relaxant, but it's been shown to improve sleep quality in chronic pain syndromes. 
um, Lyrica and Gabapentin uh, are medications that are good for pain and sleep and also among the few medications that have been shown to increase deep sleep. Uh, the best drug we have for increasing deep sleep is terazidone in very small doses. Um, Amitriptyline and uh, mirtazapine have also been shown to increase deep sleep. And uh, I always make the point that, you know, when you're talking about medications for sleep problems, we're not talking about sleeping pills. So the big three, Ambien, Lanesta, Sonata, these medications do not uh, reduce arousals. They do not increase deep sleep. Uh, you might need them to actually help get to sleep, but if you're expecting them to improve the quality of your sleep, you're gonna be disappointed. So a uh, bunch of other speakers have talked about the autonomic nervous system. I don't think I have to go into details, but I'm just gonna show you here that you know, the job of the autonomic nervous system is to keep everything on an even keel. When the autonomic nervous system doesn't function properly, your heart rate, your blood pressure, your body temperature fluctuate. Um, and those, um, and the tendency to overreact to minor stresses, all of these things are wasteful. So that this is a very simple system where we measure parasympathetic and sympathetic activity at rest. Then we have patients do slow deep breathing, which should stimulate a parasympathetic response. Then we have them clench and strain to simulate stress, which, which elicits a sympathetic response. On standing, I think y'all know your blood pressure tends to drop a little bit when you stand, but generally what happens is you make a little extra adrenaline to raise your heart rate and blood pressure, but then various other mechanisms come into play and you don't need this extra adrenaline for very long. In patients with orthostatic intolerance and autonomic dysfunction, this is the kind of thing we see. Patient stands, their body overreacts to the slight drop in blood pressure, they make too much adrenaline, then their body says, well, wait a minute, that's too much gas, we need to hit the brake. They overcorrect and drop. And this is how a lot of people faint. In this case, this person very quickly recognizes that which is too much, too much brake and hits the gas again, too much gas at the brake, no, it's too much brake, but the gas. And you see this person's been standing for several minutes, is still struggling to get her heart rate and blood pressure under control. And look at how much energy she's wasted compared to the little bit that the healthy person is using. So again, autonomic fluctuations and this overreaction to minor stresses that that you can't help. When a loud noise startles you, that's a, that's a physiologic response. That's not something you can do, but, but each time your body does that, it's wasting the energy that you're trying to conserve. And that medications that suppress that uh, can also often help you feel better, relieve some of your symptoms, and also help to conserve energy. Um, so in, in this, whoops, in this situation, um, I think you can see why, while it seems paradoxical that, gee, if I'm lightheaded and I feel like I'm gonna faint, why would I take a medication like a beta blocker that's used to lower blood pressure? Um, in fact, the frequent trigger here for lightheadedness is not that your blood pressure drops when you stand up, but your blood pressure drops, you hit the gas too hard, and then you hit the brake, you overcorrect too far. So medications like beta blockers block that initial upswing, and that's how they reduce uh, orthostasis and tends to be lightheaded. If you understand that, you understand more than most cardiologists do about orthostatic intolerance. <laughs> so, um, okay. So obviously, depending on what we find as causes of fatigue, our treatments are gonna be different, but much of the fatigue in ehlers danlos comes from chronic pain, poor sleep, depression and autonomic dysfunction. Of course, that doesn't mean that's everything and you could stop looking there. Uh, it's worth looking for particularly the more common metabolic factors that we see in ehlers danlos patients. So you certainly wanna look for common medical causes of fatigue like anemia and hypothyroidism. In ehlers danlos patients, the, the most common micronutrient deficiencies I see are vitamin D, vitamin B12 and magnesium. And I'll talk about each one of those depending on how much time I have left. Um, hormone deficiencies, I think Claire mentioned this morning that we're looking to do a little study. I've noticed over the years a number of my young female patients who have trouble building muscle are testosterone deficient. Uh, we're looking to do a study to make sure that it's not just my patients that have that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, salt fluid imbalance. I don't think I'll talk about mast cell dysfunction. Anne Maitland did a great job with that. So most important point about vitamin D deficiency is most people don't take enough. Uh, 
a normal level is 30 to 100. If you're in the teens or low 20s, just to get your level up into the low end of the normal range, takes about a million units of vitamin D. So if you're taking the standard supplement of 1,000 units a day, you're gonna be deficient for another year or two. Um, so I recommend a 50,000 unit D3 supplement that's only made by one company and I don't get any kickbacks from them. Um, it's actually non-prescription and I recommend that people take one a week until their deficiency is better and then uh, once a month or so to maintain their level. Um, vitamin B12, the important point I've learned over the years about B12 deficiency is that commercial labs have this extremely wide normal range where they say 200 to 1,000 or 200 to 1,100 is normal. Uh, pretty much everybody I've ever seen under 300 is clinically deficient. The most severely B12 deficient patient I ever saw who was numb up to his waist from B12 deficiency had a blood level of 320. So, um, and then if you are deficient, uh, that usually means that you're, unless you're a vegan, if you're deficient, you need so little B12 every day that the odds are that you're just not absorbing it well uh, and B12 shots are the way to go. Um, the, the most important point about magnesium deficiency is that only one or 2% of your magnesium is in your bloodstream. So if your doctor does a blood test for magnesium, says, oh, we checked your magnesium level is fine, that really is not helpful. Uh, some people will order red blood cell magnesium levels that are, that are somewhat better at picking them up, but in general, we just see so many, and this is not just Ehlers Danlos patients, this is true in the fibromyalgia community too, so many people respond well to magnesium supplements that that we often just recommend this, you know, almost universally. Um, oral magnesium, unfortunately, is not well absorbed, tend to cause diarrhea, so it limits how much people can take, but even if you take a little bit every day, that will help. Um, it's very well absorbed through your skin. Uh, Dr. Klein mentioned Epsom salts. Again, so Epsom salts is a great way to, to uh, get magnesium, but, uh, but the other point I, I tell people, and I make the analogy that if you're, if you're truly magnesium deficient, Correcting magnesium deficiency is like filling a bucket with an eyedropper. Uh, it takes a long time because you can only put in so much, there's only so much you can absorb per day, uh, and it may have taken you years to get as deficient as you are. Uh, testosterone deficiency, again, as I mentioned, I just several years ago happened to see several college-age women who their sleep was better, their pain was better, they were feeling better, they were exercising regularly, and they just weren't getting stronger, they just weren't building muscle at all, they were getting frustrated, their physical therapists were getting frustrated. Um, and I just said, you know, there's not that much that you need to build muscle, you need protein, you need exercise, and, and you really need some testosterone. Um, so I looked, and, and sure enough, these people were all quite low in testosterone. Um, and I usually have managed this with oral DHEA because I don't frankly feel comfortable prescribing testosterone to women. Um, there's very little literature on testosterone deficiency in women. Uh, DHEA is available over the counter, which has, gives you a little you know, margin of safety there. Um, and in fact, as those of you who watch the TV commercials for male testosterone replacement products know, uh, it's not just about building muscle, but things like fatigue and mood and libido are also, can also improve with um, androgen supplements. Uh, salt fluid imbalance. The, uh, here I'm going to uh, probably disagree with some of the other people <laughs> who've, who've spoken about this. Uh, not with Peter, because he knows, because um, we've talked about this. But, but I found that um, over the years, I've heard so many people complain about, you know, gee, no matter how much water I drink, I'm still thirsty. No matter how much I drink, I'm still lightheaded. People tell me to drink more, and I keep drinking. I can't possibly drink more water than I'm drinking, and it just doesn't seem to be helping. Um, I said, well, something, again, isn't right here. So I tried to do some basic tests of salt fluid balance. Um, and what I found was that 85 to 90% of these people were not getting enough salt. Um, so it's not, it's not their fault. It's not that they weren't listening to their body signals. Their body should have been telling them, eat salt, drink water, eat salt, drink water. And instead, their body was telling them, thirsty, 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 thirsty until basically they dilute the salt out of your system so much that you finally crave salt. Uh, so, and, and while it's hard to convince people that, gee, you're dehydrated because you're drinking too much water, that's kind of a hard sell. Uh, but but what I, the, the most, uh, the, the simplest way I found to explain this to people is to, that you basically, when you drink plain water, you're diluting out the salt in your system. And the only way for your body to get your salt levels back up is either to hold on to salt or to pee out the water you just drank. Um, so if no matter how much you drink, you're still thirsty, you're drinking too much. 
So, uh, and I looked at something called serum and neuromosmolalities, which are measures of, of salt concentration. Uh, the simplest thing to look at is, is the concentration of sodium in your urine. If your urine sodium is low, that means your kidneys are trying to hold on to salt because you're not getting enough. And I think here again, some of the, some of the autonomic labs will tell people, you know, you should be drinking so much water that your urine looks like, looks clear. And I disagree with that. <laughs> So uh, the best solution, no pun intended, are the electrolyte drinks where you're drinking salt water instead of plain water. Um, I tell people to try and limit their plain water. And again, this sounds counterintuitive, but over the years, people have been extremely thankful to be spending less time in the bathroom. Most people don't need more than two liters of fluid a day. I found very few people need, need fluidocortisone. Fluidocortisone tricks your kidney into holding onto salt. In the overwhelming majority of people, there's nothing wrong with their kidneys. Their kidneys are trying to hold on to salt. They're just not getting enough. And then uh, mast cell dysfunction, just make the point that this can aggravate fatigue, can aggravate pain, can aggravate autonomic dysfunction. And then lastly, just a word about stimulants. Um, Peter mentioned using stimulants and uh, we use small doses of stimulants, the ADHD stimulants like Ritalin to raise blood pressure and raise heart rate in people who chronically are lightheaded because their blood pressure is really too low and that's very helpful. But that's very different from using stimulants to treat your fatigue. Uh, if you're exhausted and you say, well, gee, I'll just, top, I'll just pop another one of these stimulants and then I'll, then I'll be good to go, uh, you'll get a short burst. Uh, but as one of my patients said many years ago, you're borrowing energy you don't really have. So when that little fake energy boost wears off, you'll crash that much harder and over time, you're just making your fatigue worse. Now, the exceptions are uh, modafinil and armodafinil, uh, new vigil and provigil, which are medications that help with focus and concentration and alertness and wakefulness, but they're not physically stimulating and so they don't cause that crash. Uh, response to those is very hit or miss. Some people find them extremely helpful and some people don't, uh, but I almost always think they're worth trying. So uh, how do we reduce fatigue in patients with ehlers danlos Well, we, with a thorough evaluation, try to identify as many causes as we can that are contributing to fatigue and then address them in a comprehensive treatment program. So this is something that I often leave patients with as a simple, so you know, what's the, what's the overall game plan? Well, the game plan is that if you've got severe fatigue, then your energy tank is low and how are you gonna replenish the tank? Well, sleep is your major thing to put gas in the tank and look at all the things that use it up. So we talked about pain, depleting energy. Whenever you're tired and you hit the caffeine or just suck it up and plow through it or try to kick in your own adrenaline to push through it, you're just further depleting things and making them worse. We talked about dehydration, other factors, but I think most people look at this and it's pretty obvious that their, most of their days are net negative, and most days are using up more energy than they put in the tank the night before, and that's really the basis for fatigue, and also why it's so hard to, so hard to correct. So hopefully you can make some improvements in sleep quality, lower pain a couple of notches, address depression if it's significant, feel a little better. The more active you are, the better you feel. The more active you are during the day, the better you may tend to sleep and slowly reverse that vicious cycle. And that's how fatigue gets better. So thank you for your attention. I always want to acknowledge my uh, colleagues, especially Peter and David Goldstein and IH, who encouraged me about 15 years ago when I first floated some of these ideas and everybody else thought I was nuts. But since then, my patients have allowed me to experiment on them and show that these approaches really do work. And then lastly, I want to encourage those of you who are not familiar with uh, Claire Smith's book on Ehlers-Danlos and HSD. This is just an incredible work. It's frankly encyclopedic. It addresses every symptom and every aspect of EDS. Um, it's just incredibly well done. Uh, and it's available by a single copy. It's not available through Amazon. Unfortunately, it's available single copy through the EDS website. Uh, and if you can't find it there, I think if you Google Claire Smith Hypermobility, you'll probably find a link to the EDS Society webpage. So thanks very much for your attention.